morning and welcome to the Peranakan Museum. My name is Sylvia. I'm a volunteer guide with the Friends of the Museums, which is a not-for-profit organisation that provides guiding services, amongst other activities, to many of Singapore's museums. Okay? Um, I'll begin my tour of the Pranakan Museum by explaining to you uh, who the Pranakans are uh, and basically uh, what constitutes the Pranakan culture. Right? And I would like to stress that the word Peranakan, if you look at the uh, title up there, Peranakan is a Malay word. It actually is derived from the root word anak, A-N-A-K, if you look at the four letters in the middle. Anak, you know in Malay, means child. Peranakan actually refers very loosely to locally born. That means people who were born here in Singapore many parts of Malaya and including Indonesia. But it has been used, the term Peranakan has been used specifically to a community, the Peranakan community. And I will shortly explain to you how this community came about. Just for your information, I'm also a Peranakan. As I will explain later, it is a word that is referred to the culture rather than to any ethnic group. Okay. Now, before I go into the details of who the Pranakans are and look at the material culture of the Pranakans, I would like to just give you a very brief history of this building which now houses the Pranakan Museum. It did not start out as a Pranakan Museum. This building was built and completed in 1912 right, as a school. I'm sure some of you would have heard of the name of the school called Taunan primary school, yeah? Now, Taunan Primary School was started, yes, it has moved to um, Marine Parade in the 1980s. From 1912, when it was completed to the 1980s, it operated as a school, right? And the school was actually set up by members of the Hokkien community, the Hokkien Hui Kwan, right? And they wanted their children to uh, be educated, uh, and the school started teaching the kids in the dialect of Hokkien in 1912, but then very shortly in 1916, they changed the uh, medium of instruction to Mandarin. In fact, it was the first Mandarin school in that sense, right? But interestingly enough, the monies that came towards building this school, right, came primarily from not only members of the Hokkien community, a large number of them were Peranakans. Okay? So, ironically, right, by sheer twist of fate, I suppose, that the Hokkien community, particularly the Peranakan community, who contributed to the building of this school, now would be so pleased to know that even though it doesn't operate as a school anymore, it has been converted to a museum to carry on the heritage and legacy of the Pranakan community, right? So this is something I think is very uh, interesting and worth considering. I think it is best to define who the Pranakans are by looking at a map. It really, really helps for all of us to um, you know, focus on the origins of the Pranakans. Roughly around the 15th century, right? Singapore, which is at the tip of the Malay Peninsula, as well as the whole islands around it, um, the islands of Indonesia, including the Philippines, yeah? um, Peninsula Malaya, Southern Thailand, even as far high up as uh, Indochina. All this region was called the Malay world or the Malay archipelago, and they comprise approximately about 25,000 islands and they were basically a hive of activity, lots of trade carried on amongst the people from the Malay world, right? And uh, in fact, this area was at that point in time called the Maritime Silk Route because of the hive of activity. Now, of course, because of the rich resources that these islands offered, it attracted a lot of trade coming from China, from India and the Middle East, as well as subsequently from Europe. And these traders who were of course dependent on the monsoon winds to bring their boats in, would come down 
and of course land on the ports uh, of Singapore, Malacca, Penang, the uh, coastal towns of Indonesia, particularly in Java, and of course in places like southern Thailand and the Philippines. But here we are looking at Chinese traders and Indian traders coming here, bringing with them from China porcelain, silk, and then from India cotton and different type, types of textiles. And in exchange for the very rich uh, spices that were offered from the Indonesian islands, as well as um, gold, teak, etc., that these uh, countries offered. But now, because they came here and they had to wait for the monsoon winds to bring them back, many of the Chinese and Indian traders uh, decided rather than go back uh, to settle down. And when they settled down, and here we are talking about mainly male traders, obviously at that time, you know, it was the men who were coming out uh, to trade. Many of them decided, and they settled down, to take on local women from the Malay world, right, uh, as their spouses, right. And thus, with this combination of both Chinese and Indians with the local Malay women, uh, Malay women we saw the birth of the Peranakan community, right? We have the Chinese Peranakans who for a long time practiced uh, Taoism, Buddhism, and for Indian Peranakans, because there were two different faiths that were brought, you have the Indian Peranakans who practice Hinduism, they are called Chitti Peranakans, and the uh, Muslim Indians who practice Islam, they are called Jawi Peranakans. Okay. And in Singapore, okay, now we come particularly in zooming in into Singapore, you'll find that in Singapore, because um, our population is 70% majority uh, Chinese, so you will find that amongst the Chinese community in Singapore, the Chinese Pranakans would be the majority Pranakans in Singapore. As you can see, we have uh, determine who the Pranakans are. They could either be of Chinese ancestry, mixed with the local Malays or Indian ancestry. And thus you will find, if you look around this gallery, we have put up here faces of people who say that they are Pranakans. And just by looking at their faces, you wouldn't have known, would you? Yeah, because they come in all shapes and colors and shades. Yeah, And, and this is again uh, a testimony to the um, you know, big diversity of the Pranakan community. The material culture of the Pranakans, particularly in the area of a Pranakan wedding. Because for the Pranakans, yeah, they attach a lot of importance to uh, auspicious motives and symbolism. And that uh, belief or that attachment can best be uh, demonstrated in a wedding, right? And in the past, Pranakan weddings, right, took place over 12 days. Can you imagine that? I mean, it is hard enough to have a wedding one day today, let alone 12 days. So there was a lot of um, ceremonies. And of course, we won't be going through all 12 days. I will highlight to you the important rituals and practices that occurred on certain special days of the 12-day wedding. Something that I think all of us cannot help but notice is this piece of beadwork, which is actually a beaded tablecloth, right? It's an exquisite piece of uh, beadwork. And it is a tablecloth, right? I know all of you would think a tablecloth, you know, who would want to have anything over this beautiful piece, but it is a tablecloth that is used over what we call the spring table or the chuntok. The chuntok is a, a Pranakan word to represent the spring table, which is normally placed in the wedding chamber, right? In the bridal uh, couple's room. And this particular piece, of course, is a special piece. In fact, it is regarded as the star piece for this museum. Uh, and it was a commission work uh, done by craftsmen from Penang. And if you look at it very closely, can anybody guess how many beads there are? <laughs> there is close to a million beads. Yes. And... Um, Typically, 
for the Pranakans, bead work is part and parcel of many Pranakan women uh, in terms of their ability to do bead work, right? And as I will be uh, showing you later, their bead work is normally uh, seen on items such as beaded slippers, yes, shoes, on uh, little wallets and so on. But of course, uh, a piece like this is not done by your typical Pranakan lady or we call the Pranakan ladies nonias, right? They, this one was done by craftsmen. And you will find that a lot of the um, designs here are not even local. Yeah? Can you point out to me any items that are not local? Any of the local meaning uh, of, of this region? The birds. The birds, yeah. The, the, the flowers, they are not local, uh, you know, flora or fauna. And this again demonstrates this whole idea of very European, uh, the love for anything European as well. Uh, and the beads are actually faceted beads. And at that time, we are talking about in the 1920s, 1930s, the beads were mainly imported from Czechoslovakia. Today, of course, if you look at uh, some of the bead work that is still being done, uh, I would think that many of the most of the beads would come from Japan. Yeah, but they are not as refined as the beads at this time. And here you have uh, examples of Pranakan jewelry. Uh, this is the Kurosa, right? Um, you have three different brooches. They can either be individuals or uh, individual brooches or they are joined together by a chain. You will see um, some examples of it. You have hairpins. Uh, oh yes, there, there is an example. But these are tiny uh, croissants. Yeah? And of course, you have the belt. They would wear the belt over their sarong. Yeah? You know what a sarong is. Yeah? And they would wear it over their sarong. Now, for the Pranakan brides, right? They will actually wear a headdress, right? Yeah, the one on my left, immediate left, it looks a lot more like Malay bridal headdresses, right? What happens is that the bride would tie her hair up into a bun and more than a hundred hairpins of different shapes and sizes, gold and diamonds, would be inserted, right, to form like a headdress. And these hairpins uh, could come in different shapes, could be shapes of birds or sea creatures because these are all fertility symbols. And I mentioned to you earlier how the Pranakans attach a lot to auspicious uh, motives and symbolisms. Um, the headdress from Penang, uh, you have this blue kingfisher feathers yeah, sticking out. That is very similar to a lot of the headdresses worn by brides from China. And I think primarily because of the proximity of Penang towards China, they adopted a lot more of the Chinese uh, style than the Penang, uh, the Malacca or Singapore rice. And below the headdresses are the very, very heavy uh, necklaces that are worn over the bridal gown. Now, I think a lot of us would be wondering, you know, are all Pranakans wealthy enough to afford this? I, I, I can assure you that not all Pranakans are wealthy, right? For those who uh, could afford, of course, they would have had these items of uh, jewellery already uh, as part of the family heirloom. But for those who could not afford it, they would either rent it or borrow the uh, accessories. Right. Now, some of these I, uh, items of jewellery, whether it's the necklaces or the croissant or the belt, they would often also be part of the wedding gifts. Um, they are tiered baskets and they would be the ones that you will find uh, hooks up there and a bamboo pole would be put across and you have this whole procession of men right, accompanied by musicians playing, uh, you know, typical uh, Pranakan uh, songs and ballads and the gift bearers would be carrying the gifts in this Baku Sias. Or they would also be transported on this very exquisite uh, pagoda-like tiered trees, especially the items of jewellery. Uh, gallery here is supposed to demonstrate 
the ceremony that takes place. The ceremony is called the Chiu Tao ceremony or the hair combing ceremony. And it is not particular to the Chinese Pranakan community. It is in fact a Chinese ceremony because I've spoken to some of my friends who are non-Pranakans, Chinese friends, and they say that they too go through this hair combing ceremony. Yeah? But um, what happens is that on the first day of the 12th day affair, particularly between midnight and dawn of the first day, right, the bride and groom in their respective homes would be dressed in white. As you can see the white tunic there, right? They would have been dressed in white and they would be seated on that rice measure in the middle, which is placed in the middle of that rattan tree. That is supposed to represent the bride and groom being in the middle of the universe. The rotan tree is like the universe. And for the Pranakans, they believe very strongly that a boy or a girl becomes an adult only when he or she gets married. So this is an initiation ceremony into adulthood. Okay? So they will be seated respectively in their homes, uh, dressed in white, facing this particular altar. And this altar is called the Sam Kai altar. Sam, Sam means three, Kai is worlds, the three worlds, the heavens, the earth, and the underworld, right? And this Sam Kai altar, you will notice very unique, is the way the altar is constructed. There are two tables, one with a lower table, and they are one on top of the other. And this Sam Kai altar is only a temporary altar. It is not part of the... Uh, altars that you know usually the, the Chinese families would have in their homes, they are only brought out on special occasions, two special occasions for weddings, and on the ninth day of the Chinese New Year, the birthday of the Jade Emperor. I think for Chinese, you know, we, we have that custom for the Chinese during the Chinese New Year on the ninth day, uh, particularly for the Hokkien's, they will take out the uh, sugar cane and so on. This is part and parcel of the dedication to the Jade Emperor. Yeah, okay, great. I'm glad you brought up the furniture. <laughs> yeah. The furniture is actually... furniture. Yes. It is part and parcel of this this uh, space here that you see. It's supposed to enact the living room of the house, right? So that would have been the door. As you enter the door, right, this sub type altar will be facing the door. But the groom and the bride uh, will leave the at this or her back towards the door facing the altar while the ceremony takes place, mm -hmm. right? And in a typical Pranakan home, right, in the living room, you will find the formal furniture that is displayed. And the formal furniture would be items like that. Those chairs that are made of uh, black wood with mother of pearl inlaid in them. Yeah, and these are mainly imported from China. The interesting thing about the Pranakans, because they are such an eclectic uh, community, right? Their furniture also includes a lot of local teak wood furniture. And the designs, unlike the uh, Nam wood uh, furniture, the designs are very European. Again, a reflection of that European affinity. So you have a mixture of uh, furniture, Right? But the most important piece of furniture for the wedding would be the wedding bed. A typical Pranakan wedding bed comprises two beds. It's a set. The inner bed, which is the main uh, wedding bed, and the outer bed, which is called the day bed. And as the name suggests, the day bed, I guess, is for uh, people to rest during the day. But it also forms as a kind of a sofa. Because... Pranakan weddings in the early days, even including my parents, were all match made. Yeah? And there's no such thing as courtship and going on dates. Yeah? Uh, they often only met each other on the wedding day itself. And this uh, day bed, I guess, is an opportunity for the couple, when they are alone, to get to know each other, to start talking to each other. And in front of the bed usually would be the spring table. Remember you saw that beautiful beaded tablecloth out there? The spring table would be in the front of the wedding bed and over the table would be the uh, that tablecloth. You have examples of smaller examples here behind you. And it is over this spring table that the couple will share their first meal together. 
Now, of course, when we talk about meal, we are not thinking in terms of rice and curries, but sweets and you know drinks, just as a getting to know you uh, situation. Uh, this pair of chairs is basically dressed up for the bride and groom to sit on. And the bride and groom, as with other cultures also, for their wedding, they are regarded as the king and queen. The Raja and the Rani, or, uh, you know, and, and the um, symbolisms that are usually attached to the bride and groom would be the two uh, mythical animals. One is a mythical bird called the phoenix. The phoenix represents the female and the bride and the dragon the mythical animal, the dragon, that is supposed to represent the man, the male. So the phoenix and the dragon are very important uh, items that are usually found in a lot of the wedding uh, material culture, including sometimes you will receive a wedding invitation card, you will have a, a phoenix and a dragon as well to show the coming together of these two very great uh, creatures. So this... It's basically, uh, you know, a, a kind of an enactment of a wedding procession, right? You will find that this is the wedding couple. Obviously, no guessing that this is the bride, yeah? And you will see her wedding gown. This is a typical Pranakan, Chinese Pranakan wedding gown. And although we look at it and think, wow, that's, it's so elaborate. But for the Chinese Pranakans, all brides wear the same. I mean, you know, the same attire in that sense. Uh, it comprises a very long uh, gown up till the calf and below it is a skirt that they wear. It's a two-piece uh, uh, attire. And you notice the sleeves are very long. This is actually the model, the, the uh, costume of the wedding gown is modelled after uh, the brides that they uh, wear in China. And during uh, this period, we're talking about the 18th century, 19th century, China was under the Qing dynasty. Mm -hmm. And the Qings are Manchurians. Yeah? They are actually mm -hmm. foreigners. They are not the Hans. So the Qing uh, dynasty brought with them the fashion because the Manchurians were mainly from Manchuria. They were horsemen. They rode on horses. Yeah? And so they, they attire tended to be very much like this. And so it then became part of the attire of the people from China during that period. The period, and for the Chinese overseas Chinese in Singapore, Malaya, and so on, they still adopted the fashion of the Chinese in China. And so this is what the Chinese wedding gown would look like. Now, on top of the wedding gown, you notice this layered cape. Yeah, mm -hmm. the cape is actually supposed to represent the feathers of the phoenix the neck mm -hmm. of the phoenix you know because the phoenix is a bird mm -hmm. and so you have feathers yeah mm -hmm. and this layered cape is supposed to represent the feathers of the phoenix and then of course you'll find the uh, wedding happies the men of course actually we normally don't bother with the men but <laughs> <laughs> this of course is a very ching attire as well you know uh, usually the men dress very simply you know in one of these Chinese gowns with pants and uh, they would either wear a cap and so on and of course on both sides you have the equivalent of a page boy or a flower girl mm -hmm. following these men would be from the island of Bawing. Bawing, okay. Um, we call them the Boyanis or the Bawenis. And it is an island of the island of Java. It's a small island of Java, right, in Indonesia. And many of these Bawenis men would have left the island of Bawen for work. You know, yes. they went in search of work. And many Pranakan families, including, if I remember, my grandmother, would have employed these people mm -hmm. as their chauffeurs, their gardeners, their handymen, you know, and they lived with the family. Mm -hmm. And they probably sent monies home and go back, you know, on, uh, on occasions. But they would be a major, uh, they would play a major role in the wedding procession. They would be carrying the lanterns. And here, although the Chinese characters denote double happiness, but usually the lanterns would bear the surnames of the two families coming together. So one lantern would have the male family name and one the female family name. Oh, okay, so these are the uh, they they lead the uh, wedding procession. Following the whole entourage would be ladies, often right from the uh, families, both sides. And I just want to highlight to you what they are wearing. 
they are wearing what we call the baju panjang. Yeah, the word baju means clothes. Panjang means long, the long tunic, you know, this, this top. And it is basically open in the front. Um, it's like a jacket you wear, but with no buttons or no zippers. And it is fastened together by the karosan, the three brooches that you saw just now. Um, and they would wear it over a sarong, a batik sarong. You can see there. And of course, because the material often, you know, over time they would have imported this material uh, from Europe, often it's quite uh, transparent or see-through, they would wear the inner garment. It's called the baju dalam. Now, um, this is what we call the top panjang. The word top is actually a Hokkien word which means table. Panjang means long, the long table. And this is to showcase the dining experience of Pranakans when there is a particular uh, celebration. Of course, you know, this is not how they eat on a daily basis. This is to showcase the uh, dining wear. And we are very fortunate, the museum is very fortunate to have this particular collection uh, of the dining wear. It comprises 16 different pieces Ooh. and it belonged for, you know, initially it belonged to the family of Yap Aloy, the gentleman up there and his wife. And um, Mr. Yap Aloy was said to be the founder of Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital of Malaysia. He was what we call the Kapitan China in Malaysia at that time and, you know, very wealthy man. Now, this is a specially commissioned set of dining ware because if you come closer, you look around each and every piece of the dining ware, especially the rim, you will find that there are Chinese characters that are embossed on the rim of even the little uh, bowls and the plates and the uh, saucers because, you know, that is the family surname of Mr. Yang. So it is, you know, obviously uh, very well commissioned. And of course, you have butterflies. You notice the butterflies on the uh, plates and saucers. Mm -hmm. Butterflies are also fertility symbols. Okay, so this is part and parcel again of having very auspicious uh, motives on the uh, any any item of the pranakans. Now, if you notice that this is a dining table set in this style. Now, for Chinese, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you will find how do we dine. Do we a round table? Yes. And so, this is very European. Yeah. So again, this is an example of how the Pranakans also, you know, the way they dine is slightly different. It would normally be over a long table rather than the round table that we see in Chinese homes. This, of course, is a typical kitchen, not necessarily only a Pranakan kitchen, but it's a kitchen that has been uh, set in the setting of the 1920s, 1930s. You can see exactly. You find that uh, it's very you know similar of the many homes during the era. And you'll notice, of course, uh, something that is so important in a Pranakan kitchen are the mortar and pestle, right? Uh, some for wet ingredients, some for the dry ingredients, some for things like flour and rice. And of course, uh, you can notice up there that cage, little, uh, that is basically to keep food. Remember those days, not every household would have a refrigerator and, uh, you know, that would be to store food away. Uh, and they have to raise it up to prevent insects from crawling in. And I still remember the early days where the cupboards would have be placed on little, you know, the legs of the cupboards, right, would have these little saucers with water so as to prevent ants from coming up. Now, in a Pranakan uh, kitchen, right, but more importantly, in a Chinese kitchen, they would have the kitchen god sitting up there. Now, the kitchen god is either represented in that red plaque or on a piece of red paper. And the kitchen god resides in the kitchen and to watch over the goings on in the kitchen. In addition to that, there are five elements found in the Chinese kitchen. You have the water, which comes from the tap, fire, which comes from the stove, wood, which comes from the wooden ladles, metal, which comes from the woks, right? And earth, from those earthen jars, which are used to either store water or to store rice. 
So they must have the five elements. I just want to show you something that is quite unique, the Nonya ware, which is not only a di dining ware, but it also has other uh, different pieces. For the museum here, we have one of the best collections, I would say, of different Nonya ware. Now, particularly unique is what we call here the chupus, which are small containers with covers. Here you can either store uh, your jewellery or even loose face powder or you know have it as a decorative piece. These are small ones, but the larger ones are called kam chains. Kam chains are items like this. They can range from this size to the huge ones which you will see later on. And these are all imported from uh, a particular province in China uh, called Jingdezhen and they are commissioned works and you will find that Nonya Wei, the colours are usually very strong, bright pastel colours. They love uh, the Pranakan community, the Pranakans themselves are very colourful people anyway, so anything colourful they love. And you will find that even then, they will have very auspicious motives, usually, uh, you know, the phoenix, the dragon or even the Buddhist eight symbols. Uh, the, the symbols of the, um, sorry, the eight immortals. And if you come closer, the beautiful part about these Nonya ware, and, and this is how you can determine the, you know, the ones that were actually uh, made purposely or those that are reproduced, you'll find that inside it's still also, still also glazed, glazed and, and, and with the design. Whereas nowadays, I think if you go to the shops, it's white it's inside. Yeah, these are basically reproductions. So these are really beautiful and uh, in fact, I, I, my favourite is this colour because it's quite unique, this navy blue um, This I think this museum, if I'm not mistaken, has you know, one of the largest collection of these huge kangchings. Some of them are part of the national collection and others are on loan from Pranakan community members. And these are the huge ones. They are often used to either store water, they can be used as a serving dish to serve soups, yeah, you can store uh, rice. You can see now the baju panjang has evolved, it has shortened from uh, what was a, an almost knee length uh, attire to a very shortened version which rests at the hips, yeah. And my favourite piece would be this, this particular kabaya. It's amazing, isn't it? If you come and come have a look, this is my favorite piece because it again uh, typifies the whole outlook of the Pranakans. Uh, it's all hand embroidered, yeah. And you'll find what do you see here? What are the symbols? The design? What is it? Music. Music. And then. Spanish, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. Spanish. Yeah, the flamenco oh, dancer, right. the bullfighter. Oh, my God. It's quite an amazing thing. I, I, I don't know the, the reason behind the this person who did it, but uh, I, I think, think they probably passed in the Philippines because it's Spanish. Perhaps, Spanish exactly. Spanish the, the, the different influences, oh, isn't yeah, it? Yes. Yeah, so, again, this typifies the Pranakan outlook. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, they, they of course have the usual Chinese symbols of dragons and phoenixes on their attire, but they also adopt the European style. Reindeers, like Christmas. Yes, yes. yes. Talking about Christmas and reindeers, <laughs> actually, uh, we are looking at, unfortunately, we don't have on display, but you will find that the sarongs as well, you know, right. they have adopted. And this particular so, yes. one has got the chuki, the cards, Right? In, in the back and the front is the usual floral design of the batik sarong. Uh, there have been sarongs that have also uh, fairy tales like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Cinderella and so on, you know, whatever takes their fancy. Yeah, if you look from the front, you can see the evolution of the kabaya. When it was brought to this part of the world, the textiles were mainly from India. Okay. And the, uh, you'll notice the sarong at the bottom, the batik, yeah? The designs were very typical. This, that is what we call the tumpal, which looks like a crocodile teeth, yeah? Very geometric designs. And probably because uh, the textiles came from India, particularly from places like the Coromandel Coast or Gujarat, okay? Um, and they brought the textiles here. And the top, the, what we call the kabaya now, 
uh, it was originally perhaps said that it came the word kabaya originated from the uh, Portuguese word abaya or the Arabic word kobaya, mm-hmm. and together it may be. That's how the word kabaya comes from. As you know, all our languages are often adopted from uh, very, you know, various other different languages. And so the kabaya was this jacket-like attire. And then as time goes on, here this is a typical white kabaya that was actually uh, inst- initiated by the Dutch ladies in Indonesia. Okay? Because when the ladies came out from the Netherlands, it was such a hot uh, climate for them in Indonesia and you know for them to wear their corset and their European attire it was too much so they started using white lace which is imported from Europe and then they started adopting that into the fashion of the kabaya and then of course the sarong like I say in fact in Indonesia the batik workshops many of them were first initiated by the Dutch ladies here uh, we have quite a few uh, famous um, you know, Indonesian, Dutch Indonesian ladies who adopted the workshops first. And then you find that over time, they change, the fashion changes. And uh, you will find that I mentioned earlier about the Indian Pranakans. Yeah? Mm. We have been seeing most of the items on display belonging to the Chinese Pranakans. But because of the Indian Pranakan community being very small in Singapore, it is more difficult to obtain uh, some of their artifacts. But here we have the how the Chitti Pranakans wear a sarong kabaya. It's slightly different as well. Now we have seen the material culture. We'll end our tour with the spiritual culture. Very quickly, I'll talk about the religion of the Pranakans. This is a showcase of the amulets uh, and the items that the Chinese Pranakans use because again, the majority of the Pranakans here are Chinese in this part of the world. And um, we have divination blocks yeah, when the uh, Pranakans go to the temples to pray, to ask for answers to their prayers. They would shake this canister with the sticks and you know the answers would pop out. They also use this what we call pak poi, which is like kidney-shaped blocks uh, mm. where you throw up and it's supposed to land one side head, one side tail. If it lands both mm. side, both on the same side, either way, then the answer is no to your prayers. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have all these amulets that are worn for protection. Now, in the Pranakan house, I mentioned the first altar that I talked about was the Samkai altar, and I said it was a temporary altar, taken out only on two occasions. Mm-hmm. Then we talk about the kitchen god, that is permanent dead, you know. Now we look at another permanent altar, which is the deity altar. And this is a deity altar, which is placed actually in the living room. So when you enter a Chinese Pranakan house, you will actually face the deity altar. And that is only, you know, uh, preceded when there is a wedding by the Samkai altar. So the deity altar here, and the deity altar is an important uh, item in the Pranakan house because there are deities that they pray to for protection. The common deities that are found in uh, Pranakan households is either that deity, the god of war called Kuan Kong or Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy. These are popular deities that many Pranakan households uh, pray to for protection. Yes, so this is an ancestral altar. Okay, and I'll talk a bit about ancestral altar, but a typical altar cloth is used to cover the uh, altar on special occasions. Yeah, and of course an ancestral altar, as the name denotes, is an altar to the ancestors. Traditionally, our altar cloths for the altars are usually uh, imported from China. They are silk uh, with the thread of the gold. Yes, one, these right? are traditional uh, altar so cloths. Can... Just yeah. to let you know okay. that usually okay. the altar cloths are divided into two. Just the one third on the top yeah. and two thirds at the bottom. And they would oh. have, uh, you know, designs of the uh, three star gods, uh, very auspicious designs, okay? the dragon, the phoenix. For weddings, they usually have dragons and phoenixes. Now, in Indonesia, right, interestingly enough, because I mentioned about the Indonesians having started the batik workshops, and a lot of them would have excess material. And what did they do? They adapted, right, by instead of using silk, which is usually very expensive and very hard to maintain because 
As you know, silk is not easy to maintain, especially in this weather. The Indonesian Pranakan community was so innovative that they decided to use batik instead of silk as their altar cloths. So this is only found in Indonesia. Uh, in Singapore, Malacca, Penang, they would still keep to the traditional silk altar cloths. But in Indonesia, you'll find, uh, and there was an exhibition that was uh, exhibited last year of more than 70 pieces of these altar cloths. Yeah, batik altar cloths, only batik. And they have actually followed similarly the pattern in terms of a third at the top and two thirds at the bottom. Yeah, how the altar cloth is. Uh, Yes, Phoenix. How the altar cloth is uh, constructed, mm. but they have also adapted not only uh, what the Chinese altar cloth look like, but they have incorporated local styles and local uh, interpretations of the traditional. If you look at this altar cloth, right, this is very interesting because it has in the middle, you'll find in that middle medallion, it's a coat of arms. It's actually mm. the Dutch coat of arms, the Dutch royal family's coat of arms. Yeah, and surrounding it, here, 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 these are actually phoenixes, but they are not the way we normally represent phoenix. It looks like a ball. Now mm. we reckon again. This is all open to interpretation. That because these are made in Indonesia, especially in places like Pekalongan, Semarang. Uh, these are where the batik workshops are and that the uh, batik makers themselves, not the owners, but the batik ma makers themselves, maybe they were Muslims and they can't represent uh, animals or you know human faces. So instead of representing the bird in that way, perhaps that's why they drew the phoenixes like a ball. I mean, you know, in a, a different shape, geometric, geometric, exactly, because a lot of, exactly. So this is how, um, you know, we look last year when the exhibition was held, uh, of all the batik uh, altar cloths, we looked at also the interpretation of the batik makers with what they had and how they um, projected so the traditional. Say, oh, they're just patterns. Yeah, it could be said that they are patterns. <laughs> yeah. So and, that uh, you know. And this I, is interesting is because that... this particular one, you'll notice there are alphabets here. Yeah. Look, this look is the, the phoenix. Ge yes. Yeah, geometric pictures. Yes. Yeah. Can 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 see it there, but yeah. not the way we yes. see all these things. Yes. So depending, nice. but uh, this particular one is also very interesting because mm -hmm. usually you don't have any. Uh, you only have Chinese characters on the altar cloths, right? Because it's meant for the Chinese altars. Altars, yes. But this one, because this is made in Indonesia, you'll notice that they also have Romanized alphabets. Mm, right. yeah? And what does the Romanized alphabet tell us? Now, now this one looks like K, but we reckon it's H. H-O-N-G, Hong. L-E-N-G, Ling. Now, Hong in Chinese actually means the phoenix. Ling is the dragon. Oh. So the phoenix and the dragon, but also oh, could be Ling, yes. the two families surname, Hong, Hong and Ling, Ling coming together. Ling. So, um, you know, this is all an interpretation as well. Uh, and it is very unique to have Roman alphabets on an altar cloth. Yeah, it's, very interesting. it's like a mirror. Yes. This is E, this is E, but yes. it's sort of. What is that? It's a, yes. yeah, what is it? Actually, well, with the K my apologies. The Hongling is, of course, the, the dragon and, and the phoenix and the dragon. Yeah. This could be the surnames of the family. Could be. H-O-E-O oh, yeah, well, and C-O-S-I-O-E. Right. You know the, you know, the, the oh, Indonesian, the, the, yeah. the spelling is slightly different Correct. of the Chinese surname. So, Ho, I as we Chinese so. would spell as H-O, they normally have perhaps H-O-E. Yeah. Oh, exactly, yes. I think yes. it can go. And then this one. So we reckon that these altar cloths would have been used on the uh, wedding altar, like the Samkai altar, because of the colors as well. So uh, the altar cloths also is not only on uh, what the symbols are, where they represent the, the bride and groom, but the colors that they use, bright colors. For um, ancestral altars, you would normally expect more mourning colors. This one, of course, is very unusual. It belongs to a very wealthy family, the Tan Kim Seng family, and therefore the altar vessels are made of silver. 
for ordinary members of the community, it would be typical your blue and white porcelain. Yeah, and blue being a color of mourning and you know uh, sadness. That is the color that is used, not those bright nonya waves. Okay, is this amazing piece of what was once upon a time a Chinese uh, you know sideboard? Okay, a Chinese sideboard. You notice the dragons yeah. and all those lights. Yeah. Um, the family here decided when they converted to Catholicism, mm. instead of throwing off their sideboard, they recycled it and put the picture of the Holy Family there and it became a Catholic altar. Right. You see? And this is again how the Pranakans you know, evolved. It is how they adapted to their changed environment. And that to me is the, uh, you know, the significance of the Chinese Pranakan community here. Mm. Yeah. Oh.